So today is going to be a very difficult day in the bigger household. And I should probably give you guys some context on why today is going to be so difficult for us. You see, my wife, Nicole, she was here in the first service. Um, she was raised by an incredible family, very loving parents. But there is one area where Nicole's family completely failed her. And they raised her to be a Steelers fan. I know, I know. I, I should have told you sooner. And if you can no longer attend this church in good conscience, I would totally understand that as well. But see, this actually has been a problem in our marriage because when we moved to Colorado, I gave my life to Jesus and became a Broncos fan. That's what I did, okay? And I am raising my kids in the ways of the Lord. They are Broncos fans as well, okay? But my wife refuses to repent and get on the right path. And she is just digging her heels in. We've had this conversation probably a hundred times before. I'll be like, Nicole, we live in Denver. Orange is a cool color. You like horses. So let's just do this thing. Can you just become a Broncos fan and we can call it a day? But I tell you, these Steelers fans, they're just built different. These Steelers people, they're, they're strange people because even when we give them our reject quarterbacks, they still don't want to get back on the right thing here. So it's a problem. The reason today's the problem, though, is the Broncos play the Steelers today. It's going to be a divided house for the Biggers. And so if any of you want to have me over to watch the Broncos game with you so I don't have to watch my wife, you just let me know. But, you know, some division is kind of fun. You know, like rivalries, uh, we had the CSU and CU game last night. It's kind of fun to have the crosstown thing. Maybe you grew up in a high school that just like hated the other high school across town. Like we sometimes just have pride with certain associations and affiliations. So some people, man, they're just proud of a part of the country they're from or even a part of the world they're from or a group they associate with. Uh, I even think about the fact that I've lived in four states now at this point in my life, and I cannot even tell you what the state flag looked like for three of those states. I have no idea. If you put it up in front of me, I wouldn't even know because most state flags are lame. They really are. They're just bad. Nobody cares. But the Colorado state flag, have you guys noticed? Those are like on bumper stickers, T-shirts. People have flags outside their house for the Colorado state flag. You know why? Because it's kind of cool. I mean, our state flag's kind of cool. So we even have like a little bit of pride around our whole flag and everything. But there is a whole nother type of division that is not fun at all. It doesn't create playful banter. It doesn't bring people together. It actually completely tears people apart. And that perfectly sets us up for a brand new series we're launching that will be in this fall. We are calling Closing the Gap. We are at a moment in history, in our culture, where there are massive gaps, social gaps, cultural gaps, political gaps, religious gaps, sexual gaps, financial gaps. There are chasms in our culture that now actually seem impossible to cross. I still remember when I was a sophomore in college because it actually was an election year that year. It was the first election I ever voted in. And I remember having roommates and classmates and friends who were all voting differently in different directions. And I don't have a single memory of that really creating a lot of tension and division. I didn't lose a single friendship over it. It was fine. But then as I moved on from college and the years went on, I just noticed some gaps getting wider. There's some culture wars going on and things just started to fray so much so that by the time 2020 got around, I went home and brought the whole family to visit my family for Thanksgiving. And it was the first Thanksgiving I ever had in my life where I felt real tension in my family at the holidays. Political tension, cultural tension, disagreements about how things were being handled. I tell you, it was not my favorite Thanksgiving dinner that I ever had in my life. And I bet there's a lot of us in this room, you've had some of those experiences as well particularly in the recent years. Now, the reason you're experiencing that is not because you're crazy. It's because it's actually happening. 
Now, again, just to use the, the politics example, because I know we're all living in that right now, there's been studies done on how Congress has worked together over the decades and how the different parties have kind of collaborated. So one study done over the decades watched how the different parties worked together from 1981 to 2011. And as you notice, the blue and red starts to separate more and more and collaborate less and less. There's another study done that had an image of this as well. So that's 1980-ish. Okay, still different parties, but a little bit of overlap in different places to work together. Well, this was 2015, as you can see. Now, how much do you think that's already even shifted just in the last eight years, probably? How much more do you think those things have moved apart? You see, the gaps are growing, everybody. And I think a lot of us are probably at a point where you wonder, can some of these gaps even be closed at all? Is it even possible to cross some of these chasms? And some of the things we're going to explore in this series is that probably if we continue just to pull the only levers we seem to be pulling and the only buttons we seem to be pushing right now at a moment, we're, we're probably going to be in some trouble. But we're going to make a case in this series that Christianity just might have the resources necessary to close some of the gaps in our culture. And I will also say I would never expect somebody who has not committed their life to Jesus to actually follow him and do the things he asks them to do. But if you are somebody who's committed your life to Jesus, he actually gives you very specific commands and directions for how you are to live in and engage with this world. And really what our world needs more than ever is Christians who are able to close gaps in our culture. Now, I can already tell I have everybody's attention right now. I can already see like you guys are a little bit more interested <laughs> in this than other series. So I have to, just because of the nature of this topic, add some disclaimers for this series, okay? We got to talk through a couple of disclaimers. I got to set everybody's expectations for where we're going. So first off, very clearly... This is not a series about whether your favorite color should be red or blue. Is everybody tracking with me on this? Okay. Um, we are not going to talk about whether elephants or donkeys are better animals. Okay. Um, this is not a zoo series. And also, this is not a po politics series. So uh, that's not actually what we're talking about. This is a series about Christian engagement with the culture. So, so we're not, the goal of this series is not to talk about any particular politicians or policies or signs of the end times. And I'm not saying those aren't important conversations. I'm not saying there's a place for that. It's just not what this series is about. That's not what we're going for. Uh, second, just to be very, very clear, this is not a series about Brian's personal political opinions. I know everybody has opinions right now. I have opinions. And of course, they are perfectly right and in line with the Bible. And I have no flaws in any of my opinions either, just like you. But I also know that at this particular time, our culture just feeds on controversy and hot takes. And my goal in this series is not to just be a shock jock and just say things and try to get viral on social media. Okay, th that is not what we're going for right now. I want you guys to know I do the best I possibly can every single week, not to preach my personal opinions, but to preach the word of God. That is what I really try to do every single week as well as I possibly can. Because at the end of the day, who cares what I think? Who really cares? I care what God thinks. And I hope you care more about that too. And so I try every single week to look at God's word. God, what do you really think about this? What, what do you want to say about this thing? And we need to make sure that our church's primary driver is never somebody's opinion, but the word of God. That has to be the driving force of this church. So that's what, that's what we do. Now, I also know, though, there are going to be questions through this series. As the sermons go on, you're going to be like, well, hold up, Brian. What about that? Or what about this thing? Or don't you care about that thing? And I would say, absolutely. Just because I don't say anything about it doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean I don't even agree with you about it. We just have limited time on the weekends and to cover particular things. And you guys need to know, in almost every single message I preach, I have more content I don't use than I do. Like literally, there's so much that doesn't make it to Sunday. And we have to understand, some things are perfectly okay for personal conversation, 
but they are not appropriate for the pulpit. They're just not. And so if you do want to talk to me about something outside of the message, I am so happy to do that. Uh, some of you guys may not know. I just stand right over here or out in the cafe after the service. I don't have a green room. I don't have some private space I hide and I'm just hanging out after church. And so I'll stay as long as I have to to the last person, unless I got some wedding or memorial or meeting or other commitment, I'm here as long as it needs to be. So I'm, I'm so happy to have conversations. At the same time, I also know somebody's probably thinking, well, hold up, Brian. It's different this time. The stakes are way higher. You need to speak out about X, Y, and Z. And I just also say, I absolutely agree with you. I do think there's some high stakes right now in our world. There, there, there's a lot of stakes. There's some massive conversations and decisions that are going to be made even by the end of this year. And I believe Christians more than ever need to take stands for truth with courage and love like more than ever before. And at the same time, I need us to realize that there are thousands and tens of thousands and even hundreds of thousands of people just around the vicinity of this church that are facing an eternity without Jesus. And some of us in this room, you may be the only hope some of those people have for hearing the good news of Jesus and having it change their lives. So we as a church have to make sure we keep our eyes on the prize and keep the main thing, the main thing. So what are we doing with this series then? There's one single question we are trying to answer through these weeks, just one question. This is our framework and it is this, how are Christians to navigate and engage the current cultural moment we find ourselves in? How can we live in a way that doesn't create greater gaps and divides in this world? And instead, how can we be the kind of people that bring compassion and justice and goodness and grace to this world? How can we be the people where truth can prevail and ultimately where other people can encounter God? And even as a last little disclaimer, I just want you guys to understand that I actually started preparing for this series last July, over a year ago. I have never in my life read more, listened to more, studied more, or prepped more for a series than I ever have than this one. Now, that doesn't mean this is going to be good. That's not what I'm saying, okay? That's not what I want you to start wondering. What I am saying is I want you to understand, as I'm saying certain things, I want you to understand that I have been doing my homework. I take this very seriously, guys. I have been putting my hours in on this one. And so as I'm preaching and talking about these things, I just want you to know, okay, Brian, Brian really has like put some sweat equity into what is gonna be shared in these coming weeks. And before we dig into real content here, I am not sure if there is a better time than right now for you to make sure that you are in some form of community during this season in our church and even our culture. Because uh, preaching, this is a one-way conversation right now. That's just what it is, okay? It serves a purpose. But when you start getting into smaller groups and communities, that's when the real conversations get to happen. And so I don't know what format that needs to be in for you. Nicole and I actually have a group that we're hosting in our house starting this week, just with seven families in the church, because Nicole and I are like, we want to go on this journey with just a group of people and just have hard conversations and learn to love each other and just be a small little pocket of practicing these things together. 14 adults and 19 kids in this group, everybody. Pray for my house that it does not get burned to the ground at some point over these weeks, okay? Um, but it's going to be so much fun. So I don't know if you need to get a men's group, a women's group, a study, or whatever, or if maybe you have a, just a group of friends you hang out with. I'm telling you, you're going to get so much more out of it if you have people just to bounce these different ideas off of. So there's all the disclaimers. We got them out of the way. Today, though, we need to lay a foundation. We're going to build a base that we're going to build on top of for all the rest of these weeks. So today is essential for you to understand even where we're going with the rest of the weeks. And to do that, I want to trace out a massive theme that goes through the entire Bible. And I want you to follow me on this, okay? So there's a guy named Abraham in the Old Testament. God calls him to leave his family, his home, everything he knows... And he ends up in this new location as a geographical and cultural outsider. At one point, Abraham even says, I am a foreigner and stranger among you. In the New Testament, talking about Abraham, it says, by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. Fast forward a couple years. 
Joseph comes on the scene. He gets taken away from his home and becomes an exile in Egypt. His whole family then follows him there and they spend 400 years as exiled slaves in Egypt. That family then becomes a nation, the nation of Israel, that then gets to go back to the promised land, right where Abraham started. They're home now, they're locked in, they're able to put roots down. But then they get exiled by the nation of Babylon. It says in Amos 7, Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. This is not just an Old Testament thing. You come into the New Testament, and this plays out in Jesus' life himself. When he's a baby, his dad gets a vision from an angel. The angel says, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. You know Jesus spent his early days as a refugee in another country? That's what happened to Jesus. Now, when he grows up, somebody comes up to him and says, hey, can I follow you, Jesus? And he says, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He's like, you just got to know, there's no home for you if you follow me. There's no place where you're going to be able to settle in. This entire theme then in the New Testament takes an entire sh shift from geographical dislocation to a spiritual dynamic in your life. So Jesus says in John 15, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. Two chapters later, they are not of the world even as I am not of it. So what is this foundational theme? What sets the tone for this whole series? One absolute thing you must realize about your life. Following Jesus makes you a foreigner. If you truly give your life to God, if you choose to follow Jesus, you by definition will become an outcast you will become a spiritual exile. You will be a foreigner in this world. You're not going to fit comfortably with the systems of this world, its culture, its values, its way of life. And you, on a regular basis, are going to experience a very real sense of dissonance and disconnect with the world around you. Now, there was a season in Nicole's and I's marriage where we actually were pre-kids. This was the pre-kid era of our marriage. And what I did not realize during that season is how much time we had. Uh, we, there were days where Nicole and I used to sleep in. I can't even remember. We used to do things we wanted to do. We had this thing called free time. I don't remember what it used to be like, but I know it was there back in the memory. And here's, don't hear me wrong. I absolutely love being a dad. I'm coaching all my kids sports right now. It's a blast. But if you do have kids, it's kind of like having a boulder tied to your back and then being told to climb a mountain and then the boulder is screaming in your ear the entire time you're doing that. That's kind of what, what it is. So it's just different. Now, before Nicole and I had kids, though, we actually decided to go on this trip. It was really my first time going outside of the country, like a real serious international travel kind of thing. And for me, it was really a pretty big culture shock experience. The, the languages, the food, the travel, all the different dynamics was just so new for me. And at one point in this trip, Nicole and I went to Paris. And I remember this point in the trip because we actually got lost for a brief period of time. We just got backwards. We didn't know where we were going. And one time we jump on a train, we realize we're going in the whole wrong direction. And so finally I get desperate. I'm like, all right, I just need to ask for some help. So I looked for the nicest man I could find who looked like he probably spoke English. And I was like, hey, excuse me, sir. Like, can you help me? We're trying to get here, but we're over here. And I just watched this guy just look me up and down. And this look of absolute disgust comes across his face. And he just had this look of, I hate these Americans. Like it just, oh, French people don't like us in case you're wondering. Um, if you've ever traveled though, you know what it feels like to be a foreigner. You don't fit. It just doesn't feel quite right. You're walking around Paris, everybody's got Louis Vuitton on and you have khaki shorts and a t-shirt from Old Navy. You don't fit, okay? It's just not a good look. And following Jesus means you become a foreigner in this world. Now, everyone who goes on this journey of this just foreigner experience responds to it in different ways. Everybody has a different approach. And so 
what are some of the different ways people try to live in this world? And maybe you can place yourself in one of these categories. So one response some people have to this dissonance they experience is they decide, you know what I need to do? I'm going to live apart from the world. So some people get to a point where they say, you know what, there's nothing really redeemable in this world and I don't want to catch this contagious disease of the culture. So what I need to do is just disengage. Let's separate from as many of the organizations and institutions in this world as we can. And if you are somebody here who has enough ammunition and supplies to last 100 years in your basement, this actually might be you. You might be one of those people. You're prepared. You are ready to go when everything goes, uh, hits the fan. Now, the apart people, there's a strength to this you might be able to avoid some of the cultural contamination. Just avoid it completely. But there is a weakness. Because if you go too far down this road, you end up being so separated from a world that you don't bring any good to it either. That's the problem with the apart approach. Now, some people, though, they have a whole other approach. They say, you know what it is? You know what we need to do? We need to live against the world. And so these are the people who say, you know what what time it is? It's time to declare war. In Jesus' name, there will be blood to the glory of God. And you can almost develop this hostile and antagonistic relationship with the world and even the people in it. Now, I will say the strength of the against group is usually they are the ones who are not afraid to speak truth. They are not afraid to post on social media. They, will, they, they are keyboard warriors, okay? But the weakness sometimes of the against folk is their ways of engaging with the world actually undermines the very work of God that they think they're doing. Now, there's another approach here. Some people say, no, 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 this is how we need to do it. We need to attach to the world. And so the mindset here is here's what we need to do. We need to embrace and accept our culture. So in the name of unity and tolerance and acceptance and inclusivity, let's just love everyone Let's all, let's all just give each other a big hug. Let's all just be friends, okay? We all mean well. You know, we want to do this life together. And here's the strength. The attached people can sometimes get those people that are down on the fringes. And they can definitely get people under the umbrella. But the weakness is you can end up even unintentionally compromising some of your very Christian convictions. And you can become very naive to what is very real evil in this world. So every single one of those have some of their strengths and weaknesses. Jesus actually has a totally different approach. It's counterintuitive. It's not natural, but it is the call of every single Christian. Jesus in John 17 says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. So really, the call of a Christian is to be an alternative to the world. Jesus said very clearly, you are not of the world. You do not belong to the world. And yet at the same time, you are not getting taken out either. And so Christians are actually supposed to be this alternative community that's living with a different value system, a different way of life. And you are supposed to be deeply present in this world while also being radically different from it. You don't fit. You are not supposed to fit. And so your job is to figure out how to live as a foreigner in this world. That's your job. And that's what we need to figure out how to do. So the question then is, how do you live as a spiritual exile? How do you live when you're feeling so much disconnect and dissonance with everything happening around you? What do you do when you're just trying to figure out all these different gaps you see in our world? Well, we're going to go through three things here. What do we see from the Bible? First thing we're all called to do is you have to embrace an alternative identity. Uh, There's some interesting language even around travel and people going in different cultures. Um, If you travel a lot, people will say things like, I'm homesick, or they'll even say things like, I'm experiencing culture shock. There's actually a real psychological term for somebody who is having an extreme experience of this, and it's called rootlessness you can actually have this experience in your own mind and emotions where you don't feel like you belong to any particular person or place. You feel totally rootless in this world. I've had a lot of conversations with older people, especially just in recent months. And I noticed a common theme, especially from the older folk. They say things like, Brian, 
this doesn't even feel like the same country anymore. Like, I don't even recognize this place that I've spent my entire life on. It's almost a feeling of rootlessness. And just as you can feel rootless with geographical locations, you can start to feel rootless as a Christian too. Because you're just like, I don't fit. This doesn't work. Like, this is not even where I really want to be right now. And though you are a foreigner, you do have a home. Paul in Philippians 3 says, but our citizenship is in heaven. So you're not rootless. You actually do have a place. You, you have a people. Paul says you do have citizenship somewhere. Think of how loaded that term citizenship is. That's a powerful term. Think about how much controversy is going on even just around that single word in our culture right now. And just to put that aside, let's just talk about the concept itself. You think of someone who's a citizen somewhere. Uh, usually that comes with a particular language, uh, different customs, it's food, it's different cultural norms, it's how you schedule your time, what you think about family, what's important. Sometimes citizenship comes with real privileges. Uh, your residence, being able to participate in the process, different protections, access to benefits, even unique responsibilities, different areas of service, taxes, laws, even a, an identity. You have some common history, you have a certain amount of even patriotism around it. I mean, think of the different countries just in our world right now, like a, a country like Japan. Japan has a whole culture just around bowing. I, just even to the degrees, how much you go, it can be used for a greeting, an apology. It's used for formal ceremonies. It's literally such a critical part of their culture. Uh, if you go to the other side of the planet, you go somewhere like Argentina, tango dancing is actually a really big part of Argentine culture. Everything from spontaneous moves to pulses to suspensions, it's just a big part of their culture. Now take a minute and just think of American culture for just one minute. Grown men who should never take their shirts off, taking their shirts off in front of 70,000 people and then painting their bodies in sub-zero temperatures. And I'm proud to be an American. <laughs> but you're saying, when you're a citizen, you have a home. You fit. Things just feel comfortable. They feel right. You fit in the way things work. And Paul in Ephesians 2 says, so now you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his family. Man, that is a good word right there. That, that is a really good word right there. While you may be a foreigner here, you have a home with Jesus with his people. And so our fundamental identity as followers of Christ should not be in a party or a political system or a platform or even a country. Because if you fit neatly in a political party, it may be a sign that you don't fit neatly in the kingdom of God. One, one person half clapped, but then they got scared. No, you don't have to clap. It's okay. I, it's okay. No, it's okay. Um, totally fine. Christians are primarily citizens of heaven. That is where your primary identity comes from. And we should feel most at home, not with our political allies, but with our Christian brothers and sisters. That, that, that's where your home is. You are a citizen of heaven. So, if you can get your identity straight in your mind and your heart, you then can step on to the next two things because you also have a call from God to live an alternative life. Peter um, was a follower of Jesus, one of his closest followers when he was here on earth and he wrote some letters in the New Testament. At one point, Peter says this, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul, live such good lives among your unbelieving neighbors that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Did you catch that? Peter uses the same idea. He's like, oh yeah, you're a foreigner. You're in exile. You are not gonna fit. 
At the same time, you need to learn how to live the life Jesus is calling you to. You are on a battlefield right now. He said you are at war. There are desires and ways of this world that are waging war on your very soul. There is violence happening right now spiritually in this world. And as tempting as it is to try to be apart or attach or just, you know, bring on the gloves yourself, Peter says, well, hold on. You need to be an alternative. You need to live a different kind of life. You need to live a life that is so countercultural and compelling that people will actually take notice and see that there is a supernatural dynamic to your life. So much so that it even draws their attention and their affections towards God himself. That is the kind of life you are called to live. There's a guy named John Beckett. He's an MIT grad who was on the absolute fast track in the business world, climbing the corporate ladder on his way to billions, the whole thing. Now, John faced one particular tension, though, as he was climbing this ladder. And it was the fact that a lot of his meetings from work and his business dealings would happen at strip clubs. It's just part of the work culture. And John did not want anything to get in the way of him being able to get to the highest heights of his career. But the problem for him was that he was a Christian and he felt some real dissonance with the ways of his industry because he really felt like clubs were degrading to women. He felt like it would disrespect his wife to even step foot him. He ultimately felt like it would dishonor God. And so he finally got to a point where he said, you know what, I, I have to just draw a line here. And, and he told his coworkers and his clients, like, if it's at a club, I just can't go. And he was the one who was initially accused of doing wrong. And all his coworkers were like, dude, you don't understand. This is going to kill your promotion potential. Um, you are burning bridges with clients right now when you do this. And yet John felt like his call to live a God-honoring life was greater than his call to a successful career. And so when they would go to the clubs, he'd go back to the hotel. He'd catch up on some work. He'd call his wife. He'd call his kids. But he didn't quit his job. He said, I'm going to stay in this game. And I'm going to learn how to navigate the complexity of this thing. And so he held his ground in certain areas, but he also looked for ways to love his coworkers, to serve them, to live in an alternative way. And over the years, his coworkers realized that he wasn't just living a different life from them. He was living a better life. And so many of those people that were once accusing him of doing wrong ended up experiencing the same grace of God that John was trying to live out himself. It completely changed their own lives. Here's where I'm going with this. Christians should engage the workplace differently. Christians should engage in romantic relationships differently. Christians should manage and use their money differently. Christians should engage in political discourse differently than the world. Your life should be a small glimpse of how heaven operates. Because that's where your citizenship is from. So this is a question we all need to be asking ourselves on a regular basis. You look in the mirror and you ask this, is my life a compelling alternative to the culture? Is it? Are you really living the alternative life God is calling you to? Now there's one last thing we are called to do. If you choose to follow Jesus, you want to go on this path with him, you have a responsibility to promote an alternative solution. Now think about the moment we're in right now. There are a lot of solutions getting put forward. There's different policies, different strategies, different ideas, all these things like this is what's going to improve education, our economic situation, all these different areas of society. And there's a place for all of this, right? This is why we have debates. This is why we have political parties. This is why we have podcasts. And we hope that at the end of the day, the best ideas win. That's what we hope, at least. Um, what is the primary solution, though, 
that Christians should be advocating for? What should be the main message coming from the church? Well, Paul in 2 Corinthians says this, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. What an unbelievable comparison Paul is making right here. Paul says, you're an ambassador. That's political language. What's an ambassador? It's a political position. You are somebody who is representing your nation on foreign territory. You're trying to promote your nation's interests. You're trying to build strategic relationships. You're ultimately trying to move the purposes forward. I love, there's a woman who found me after the first service and she's like, Brian, I've been told like the church is really just supposed to be an embassy for the kingdom of God in this world. Like your home is a small little embassy in your neighborhood representing the kingdom of God right here in the world. I just loved that image. You get it? You're Christ's ambassador. God has appointed you to speak on his behalf, to live on his behalf, to represent him in this world. So what does that mean, everybody? What it means is the call of the church is not to promote a political agenda, but to proclaim a risen savior. That is the call of the church. Is there a place for political engagement for Christians? Absolutely, yes. Keep coming back. We're going to talk about it. But we are not electing a Savior in November. We already have one. His name is Jesus. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. I, uh, I was talking to a pastor friend a while ago just about the whole political dynamic in our culture right now. And what he said just really stuck out to me. He's like, you know, Brian, I care deeply for our country. I, I love this country. I'm, I'm a citizen of this country. And so I pray for this country. And every time I have an opportunity to vote, I try to do my very best before God to vote for and advocate for laws and policies that I believe will best serve the people of this country. That's what I feel called to do. Then he pauses and he's like, but the primary call of the church is not to save America. He said the primary call of the church is to save Americans. And our ultimate allegiance is to a greater kingdom. We are ambassadors for Christ. And when the church devolves into becoming a pawn for worldly parties and agendas, we sell our soul. And we just offer our services to the highest bidder. Hear me today. The church is not for sale. The church is not for sale. There is a critical foundational aspect to the Christian faith. And it becomes central in the New Testament. And it is one single word. It's the word gospel, which literally translates good news. That's what it means. Now, what's fascinating about this word is in the first century, it was used for military victories. If you want to battle war, you'd call it the gospel. It was also used for very important political events and ceremonies. So if a new emperor was born, it was called the gospel. Because this is the good news for this empire. This is going to be the person who's going to bring us peace and stability and prosperity. Think about right now at this moment in time. Every single party, institution, interest group has a gospel right now. There's policy gospels being, being put forward. Hey, this is what is going to fix all of our problems. There's technology gospels out there. Hey, artificial intelligence, all the robots are going to do the hard work and we could just sit martinis on the beach, okay, when they do all the hard labor. Uh, there's financial gospels. If we just reallocate the finances and give them to these people and take it from that people, it's just going to fix all the problems. Everybody's going to be happy. Well, this concept of gospel takes on a whole new meaning when Jesus shows up on the scene. In Mark 1, it says Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. 
The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And Jesus takes a term loaded with political gunpowder and he lights a match. And he says, the gospel, the good news, it is here and it is me. Jesus says, I am the gospel. I am the good news. I am the one who's gonna bring true peace and prosperity to your soul and this world. And the core problem of our world is not just bad policies. It's not just bad political leadership. It's not just our broken systems. It is sin. We have broken our relationship with God. We have created a massive gap between us and him. And what we have discovered now is we can't close the gap ourselves. We can't do it. Our souls are stained with sin. Even if we were able to figure out perfect policies for this world, we would ruin all of them because of our sin. But I have good news for everybody here today. God came into this world. He sent his one and only son, Jesus, who died in our place for our sin once and for all. And then he rose from the grave, everybody. He defeated sin and death once and for all. He is alive, he is ruling, and he is reigning. Jesus closed the gap between you and God. And so what does this mean? This means our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, you become a citizen of a new kingdom. It is a perfect kingdom. It is a kingdom that will last forever. It is the kingdom of God. And I have good news for you today. His kingdom is coming, everybody. The kingdom of Jesus Christ.